Uh, I, I have been fortunate uh, to live on a piece of property that has been in my family for five generations. Uh, my daughters are actually the fifth generation to get to live on that piece of property. And so uh, kind of littered throughout the barns are all these tools and, and trinkets from, from uh, decades past. And so if you think you have junk... I have generations of junk. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but one of the fun things that, that there is to do is to go kind of through the barns and just kind of explore and try and find uh, something that you've never seen before and, and then guess what it, what it was used for, right? And so I, I brought a couple of those things. Uh, and, and I want to see if anybody can tell me what this is. Ah! Nail puller. That's that's right. And, and I'll, I'll be honest. I, I thought like surely this was like some antique that that. No, they still make these things, <laughs> right? It's, it's just it's just a really old one. But I, I still wanted to bring it up here because it's a good example of uh, of a tool. It is a tool that is it, like everything about its design is perfected for that purpose, right? The the harder the nail uh, grips into the wood, the the more pressure you put down, the harder those te- teeth uh, grab hold, and uh, the, the more grip you get in, in pulling out that nail. I'm sure this one is probably in production somewhere, too, but anybody know what this is? I think this one is broken, too. So, Anybody recognize that? What's that? A tooth puller? Yeah, my dad, he, he of course, knows. He's like, yeah, I had that when I was a kid. <laughs> What's that? Okay, what is it? Yeah, it's a bull lead. Right? Like, that's pretty wicked. <laughs> but this is the thing. Again, it's a tool that's, that's created for a specific purpose. And, uh, man, you put that in a, a bull's nose, and, and you've got control of an animal that is many times stronger than, than you. Right? You, you have total control. Now, I, I wanted to start off with that because uh, looking at tools like this is interesting because they're all created for a purpose. They're all designed for, for a, a unique challenge, right? The tools are, are fascinating because they, they tell a story of hard work and ingenuity, right? Sometimes that tool would be essential. Like a, a tool can make the difference between uh, a harvest of plenty and, and a harvest of want, Right, a, a, a tool, uh, the nail puller, man, that, that can take a junk piece of wood full of, of nails and make it salvageable, right? The, the tools all tell a story of, of a human need and, and human ingenuity that, that has uh, attempted to meet that need. Now, God, too, is in the business of making tools, right? He, he crafts for himself instruments to be used in, in reaching the, the, the world, and these instruments, they're not... They're not made out of cast iron or, or wood. No, the material that God is working with is, is men and women, like you and me. Right? God is working to craft us in, into tools that he can use to, to build his kingdom. Paul of Tarsus was such an instrument. But we are going to spend the next 13 weeks, and yes, I did say 13 weeks, <laughs> talking about the, the life of Paul. All right, we're going to try and we're not even going to get to go through his whole life because uh, there's a section of his life that's recorded in Scripture and, and then there's tradition. We're, we're just going to stick with the part in Scripture. And my hope is that as we look at the, the story of Paul, as we, we look at the faith journey that he travels, that we'll be able to see our own faith journey reflected in his. Because that's usually how it works. As, as we study these, these biblical heroes... Oftentimes, their faith story uh, resembles our faith story. So we're going to be dedicating some, some time there. Uh, some things that you need to know about Paul is Paul of Tarsus was an apostle. And, and what that means is that he is a, one of the founding teachers of the church. In, in fact, uh, roughly about half of the New Testament has been authored by the apostle Paul. It's hard to overstate uh, the influence of, of the apostle Paul. Uh, one measure that, that we could go by is the impact that, that he has had on people throughout the years. 
And I want to give you three church theologians that, that Paul impacted, and, and because of his impact, it, it significantly affected the church. First, in the year 386, Augustine found himself weeping beneath a fig tree. Right? He was overwhelmed by a sense of guilt and the power of his own sin. And in that moment, as he was overcome with grief, he heard children singing. Take and read. Take and read. He, he looks around, and, and he doesn't even know if the children are, are off in the distance or, or if this is just uh, words in his own head. But he, he takes these words as being words from God, and so he goes and he grabs the first book that he finds, and it is a book containing the letters of the Apostle Paul. And he reads the first words that his eyes fall on. He reads these words. It says, not in sexual immorality or in sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Put on the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Romans 13, 13 through 14. Now, the effect that these words have on Augustine was immediate and powerful, right? He comments, he says, For instantly, even before the end of the sentence, a light of confidence now darted into my heart, and all the darkness and doubting vanished away. Augustine had started his path towards a conversion. These words uh, by Paul were, were echoing into the life uh, of Augustine 300 years after Paul had breathed his last breath. Over a thousand years later, a German monk named Martin Luther struggled to find peace. Martin's years of prayer and fasting, of confession, and a, a spiritual pilgrimage to Rome, all of these things were insufficient to give him spiritual rest. And in 1519, while studying in the Tower of the Black Cloister, Luther came across these words from the Apostle Paul. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is being revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Romans 1, 17. Luther realized that the righteousness that he needed, the peace that, that he was searching for, wasn't something he could earn. Right? It was nothing that, that he was going to, to ever be able to merit. It's a free gift of God. And once this gospel insight penetrated into Luther's soul, he was a changed man. He writes, Here I felt that I was altogether born again, and it entered paradise itself through open gates. Neither Martin Luther nor the Western Church would ever be the same again because this renewed understanding of grace, it would spark the, the Protestant Reformation of which we're all a part. In the early 18th century, a, a young Anglican priest pursued the rigors of a strict devotional life, and, and he even goes so far as to hazard a, a missionary trip to the New World. Despite all of these labors, this priest, John Wesley, is plagued with the thought that he was not redeemed. Right? Despite all of his good deeds, he was not saved. And it was in 1738 at Eldersgate in London that Wesley underwent a life-changing experience. He attended a gathering where Romans was being read. And Wesley commented on what happened to him as he listened. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he hath taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Right? There's no doubt about it. Paul was a tool in the hands of God, and his words and his work is as effective today as it was thousands of years ago when it was first penned, because I am willing to bet that if we were to take a poll of those of us that have read and studied the Bible, that many of us have been impacted in a similar way. There's, there's been a moment when we read the words that, that Paul wrote, and, and it impacted our faith in a way that created a turning point in, in our life. If there's no doubt about it, Paul's contribution to the Christian world, it, it can't be overstated. And yet, we often forget how his story began. Right? We talk about his, his intellectual genius. We, we talk about uh, you know, his teachings. 
And we forget that, that our first mention of Paul in Acts 7, he's an influential religious leader known in Judea as Saul. And I want us to pause there for a moment because in the text that we're going to be using for the next two or three weeks, uh, Paul is referred to as Saul, but I'm just going to call him Paul, right? And so I, I don't want that to, to confuse us. But in Acts 6 through 8, uh, we, we see this, we, we, we get this pivotal uh, section of Scripture that's chronicling some significant events that happen in the Christian community. The, the passage begins with the introduction of, of a man named Stephen. Stephen was a devoted follower of Jesus. He, he's one of seven men that's chosen to serve the church by caring for the church's widows. And Stephen is described as a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Over time, Stephen's influence grows, and he faces opposition from members of the local Jewish community. They challenge him, and yet they cannot resist the wisdom and the spirit in which he speaks. Right? This leads them to, to do the only thing that, that they can do, and that is to lie. Right? They can't beat him in, in a debate over Scripture. They, they can't beat him or, or, or really speak against his character. And so they do the only thing that they can do, and that is they lie about him. And they, they claim that he's blaspheming Moses, the prophets, and God. And then these alt accusations ultimately result in, in Stephen being arrested, and, and he goes to a trial before the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrin were a re ruling religious council of Judaism, and they were a council that likely Paul was a part of. Now, during Stephen's defense, Stephen delivers a, a powerful speech recounting the history of Israel and, and repeating, uh, proclaiming to the people their nation's repeated resistance to the messengers of God. Right? It wasn't him that's trashing the prophets. It, it's, it's been the Jewish people. Right? They refused to follow Moses. They refused to follow the prophets. And ultimately, they had refused to follow Jesus Christ. And so in the midst of giving this message, the people become enraged, and they condemn Stephen to death by stoning. In the face of death, Stephen remains steadfast in his faith, and he sees a vision of heaven. This is what it says. This is Acts 7, verse 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Right? This infuriates the religious leaders of the Sanhedrin. And so they drag Stephen out of the city, and they begin to stone him to death. And there, right, with this angry mob, we get our first glimpse of Paul. Acts 7, 57 says, At this they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, rushing at Stephen, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Paul, referred to here as Saul in this passage, is depicted as a young man approving of Stephen's death and participating in the persecution of, uh, of Christians. This passage serves as a significant turning point in, in the book of Acts because it's the first martyrdom of a, of a Christian. And this sparks a, a persecution uh, against the early church that causes them to scatter throughout uh, the region. And that persecution, it's led by none other than Paul. Right? In his zeal, Paul will travel from city to city, and he will seek to shut Christians up any way that he can. Right? If he can do it with intimidation, then he'll intimidate them. If he can do it by debating them, he will debate them. But if he has to, he's more than willing to kill them. And so he travels from city to city with that as his goal. Now, he continues down that path until... He comes face to face with Jesus, and then everything changes. And we're going to spend the next two weeks talking about Saul's uh, or Paul's conversion. But for today, I want to talk uh, about who Paul was, and more importantly, how it was that, that God was going to use him 
Right? He was, God was crafting for himself a tool for a particular purpose. And so who was Paul? Paul was born around 5 to 10 AD in the city of Tarsus. Uh, Tarsus is a city located in modern-day Turkey. His father was a devout Jewish man named Simon. And he was believed to be a, a man of considerable wealth. He's believed to be a person of considerable wealth because he's one of the few Jews that, that attained the status of Roman citizen. And, and then that Roman citizen gets pass, citizenship gets passed down to Paul, and, and that's going to play into Paul's story. That's, that's going to uh, affect the, the gospel's uh, movement through, through the Roman Empire. Paul receives an excellent education in Jerusalem under the esteemed Gamaliel. A prominent Pharisee and member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, and, and this education, the Jewish law and tradition, made Paul a skilled and zealous Pharisee. He eventually held a position of authority within the Pharisaic community, and as a Pharisee, Paul was deeply committed to Jewish law and Jewish traditions. And this is initially what leads him to persecute early Christians. Now, as I prepared for this, I, I came across a video of an Israeli man that was telling the story uh, of his father's um, participation in the Six-Day War. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Six-Day War, the Six-Day War was a war between Israel and, and the surrounding Arab nations around them in 1967. And this man, he, he shares that his father was a pilot and as a pilot, he was tasked with providing air support to the Israeli troops. And as he entered the battle zone, he, 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 he saw a column of, of tanks and, and vehicles. And so he lines up his plane, and, and in a single pass, he takes out the entire column. Having emptied his weapons, <laughs> he turns and, and heads back, proud that he had defended his people only to find out that the column that he had attacked was his own troops. Can you imagine? Right? It's known as friendly fire. And it is the result of zeal without knowledge. Or, or, or at least zeal with incomplete knowledge. And, and I think it's a pretty good description of Paul's persecution of the church. Paul's desire is to serve his God. Right? His, his faith and devotion to his faith is real, but in his zeal and lack of knowledge, he attacks the work of God. He attacks the church. Right? In his self-righteousness and pride and religiosity, Paul doesn't know friend from foe. He can't tell who has a heart to serve God and who is seeking their own agenda, and so he fires on the wrong side. Paul is a man that will have to deal with this mistake for the rest of his life. And without doubt, it weighed on him heavy. So I want us to just imagine what that would feel like and how that would affect our faith story. Right? We, we, we know he persecuted the church, but, but think about the weight of it. He killed people. He encouraged others to kill people. He resisted the will of God. We can see Paul's thoughts on this in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. He, he writes this. He says, For I am the least of the apostles. I do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. See, to the world and to Paul himself, Paul was just a self-righteous, egotistical, murderous, prideful teacher of the law. But to God, oh, Paul was so much more. To God, Paul was an instrument prepared for a special task. Paul tells us about that too in Galatians 1. He says, but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. To God, Paul was a man chosen to change the world, right? Paul was going to be his special instrument <laughs> prepared for a special task. Paul was going to be the man that, that takes Christianity from being a, a strange Jewish sect to being good news that the entire world would hear, right? To, to be uh, good news that, that every nation 
would be impacted by. See, as Christians, we're not an ethnic group. We are a people made up of every tribe and nation. And Paul was the man that God had chosen to do that work. Now understand, there were walls built between the Jews and the other nations of the world. Walls of oppression and injustice. Walls of judgment and hate. And God had chosen Paul to be the man that would scale those walls and take the good news of Jesus to the whole world. Paul was to be the key to the nations. Here's the short of it. God had a purpose for Paul. Now some of you might be thinking, wait a minute. Paul was a mess. And Paul did some terrible things. Surely uh, the persecution of the church, surely the murder of Stephen, surely these things should have disqualified him from such an important task. Why would God want those things to be a part of Paul's story? Right? Th those are good questions. And the answer to that question is that I don't think God did. I, I don't think God wanted Paul to persecute the church. See, there are things within Paul's story that, that de God definitely set up. There's, there's Paul's Roman citizenship, which is going to be pivotal, pivotal as, he, as he preaches the gospel. Right? There's his time studying the upper echelons of, of the Jewish leadership that equipped Paul to understand and explain the gospel to the Jews of his day. But then there are other parts of Paul's story where Paul's free will takes over. Right? It's all Paul. Right? With privilege and education that wealth affords, well, there's also pride and arrogance. Right? As he saw the ministry of Jesus and, and the church taking off, Paul faced fear. Because everything he had worked for was in the balance. And so I would say that God didn't ordain every choice that Paul made, while at the same time, I, I want us to recognize that God redeemed it all for a purpose. Right? I, I think the same thing is true in our lives. God seeks to shape and use us for a purpose, but at the same time, we, we have a sinful nature that's, that's trying to lead us off track. And so we, we get this thinking, well, well, all things happen f for good. That's not biblical. Right? When we sin, we bring pain, hurt, and destruction into this, into this world. Right? And that, that is true for us. But the beautiful thing is God uses us despite our struggle with sin. See, God doesn't give up on those he loves. Instead, he seeks to work within the circumstances of our lives so that we might be drawn to him. And as God draws Paul to himself, he transforms arrogance into humility. Right? He transforms violence into compassion. God takes all of the worst things about Paul and he turns them on their head so that, so that Paul might be an instrument in God's hand. And then he puts Paul on mission. He says, go, preach. Right? Proclaim what God has done for you. And Paul takes the gospel to the nations. The, the short of it is this. Paul's story opens doors for the gospel. So does yours. Your story opens doors for the gospel. Paul, uh, it, it, the minute Paul came and, and accepted Jesus, all of a sudden his store, story unlocks a whole bunch of doors. Because he can take the gospel to places no one else can take it. Your story opens doors for the gospel. Sure, maybe you've made some mistakes in the past, Understand, God did not choose those mistakes, right? They did not have to be a part of your story, right? God didn't want those mistakes to be a part of your story. But this is the thing. He can redeem them, right? He, he, can, he can use them for his purpose. Our adversary whispers lies and tells us that, that we're too far gone, that, that we can't be of use to the kingdom of God because uh, our mistakes are too great, our temptations are... are are too big, our self-control is too little. And so we're tempted to shut the door to the gospel in our lives. But the story of Paul unlocks that door because if God 
uh, could use a self-righteous, egotistical, murderous, prideful teacher like Paul, why can't he use you? Right? If he can use a man that, that, that's whole purpose was to, to resist and destroy the church and make that man into probably the most influential Christian leader the world has ever known, why can't God use you? He can, and he will. See, God invites you to know him and to make him Lord of your life and to hand your life to him in such a way that he can redeem and reshape you for his purpose. Right? You have been uniquely positioned to proclaim the gospel. Every one of you. We tend to think, man, man if, I, if, if only I had a position of, of influence. Man, if, if I was a missionary or a preacher or a youth group leader, I'm telling you, every one of us has been positioned to proclaim the gospel. And so I want to ask you, what, what challenges have you overcome? What, what doubts have you faced? What temptations and mistakes have you made? What blessings has God given you? Right? All of these things are a part of your story, and they're all a part that God uses to unlock doors for the kingdom of God. I was listening to a podcast uh, a week or so ago uh, where a guy was talking about his ministry to, uh, to men within the prison system. And he, he said that his goal, as he loves and, and serves those hardened convicts, is to prepare them for the mission field. And he, he, he goes further and says that, that he, his goal is not to win converts. His goal is to prepare them for the mission field because, because oftentimes Jesus reaches them within those walls, right? As they enter the prison system, they've, they've hit rock bottom, and Jesus reaches them, and he wants to equip them so that when they get out, they, they can join the mission field. Because these men, the, these hardened convicts, they are uniquely suited to reach the young men out on the street. Right? His, his ministry seeks to teach and, and disciple the incarcerated and then walk with them to reenter society so that they can carry the gospel to spaces that others would, would never get a access. Right? Others can't get access because they're not a part of that community. Right? They're, they're, not, they're not a part of that neighborhood. They, they have no credibility in that space. But, but these convicts, they do because they're somebody's husband. They're somebody's boyfriend. They're, they're somebody's uh, brother or, or father. Right? They're a neighbor and, and a friend. And so these men come out of the prison system having experienced the gospel. And they're uniquely positioned to unlock doors for the gospel. Same thing's true in your life. Right? Whether your story is a story that has a lot of... Uh, drama and, and dramatic flair, or whether your story just feels common and standard, God has uniquely positioned you to preach the gospel. There is a sphere of influence that you can affect that no one else has the same in that you do. Make no mistake about it, we are in a spiritual war. And every time we fail, every time someone wounds us, every time our insecurity gets the better of us, I want you to imagine it's like our adversaries just lobbing a grenade at us. And I think Jesus is right there in that moment saying, pick it up, throw it back. Right? Pick it up, throw it back. Because I think we, face, we have a choice about what we do with the grenades in our lives. We can, we can let them go off and take us out. Or if we've got the courage to handle it. Right? If we've got the courage to grab hold of them and, and, and throw them back, those things can become a weapon used against our adversary. Right? The, the painful and destructive, the shameful parts of our story, those can be used as a weapon against our adversary. That's the power of redemption. Right? When, when we talk about redemption, that's what we're talking about is God's ability to take what is broken. Right? Everything that is messy and broken and messed up in our lives, God can take that, redeem it, and use it to accomplish his will. Right? The hurt, the pain, the shame that tempts us to lock the doors of the gospel. Right? The, the, the guilt and the shame that tempts us to sit back and let someone else do it, God can use that to unlock the door 
of the gospel for others. Your story can unlock the gospel for others. And so this is my challenge for us today. This is what I want us to walk away with today, and that is this. Share your story. Right? I know for some of you, man, that is a scary thought because you have come so far. Right? You don't want to think about those days. Right? God has done such a work in your life. You're happy and fulfilled in who God has created you. I mean, you just want to leave those mistakes in the past. I'm telling you, you need to tell your story. Because there are people who are struggling right now. And they're thinking, man, I'm not like them. Now, I, I, I messed up. I, I got problems. And there's such power when God's people stand up and say, you know what? This is who I was. This is who I became. God, did the, God made the difference. So tell your story. As you tell your story, I want you to understand it's not about uh, glorifying sin. right? It's not about uh, telling that funny story that's going to entertain everybody about your sinful days. No, it's about giving glory to God and making sure that people know that God is as active in our lives today as he was in the times of, of, of the Bible. Right? God is active. And so let's share that story. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you uh, grateful that you don't give up on us. Grateful that, that you, uh, you desire to use each one of us, not in a selfish way, but Lord, in a way that fulfills us and, and builds us up. And Lord, I just pray that we would have the courage uh, to allow you to, to use us. Lord, I pray that you would put it on our hearts, the, the people, the the. the the things that, that you're calling us to do, Lord, that, that we would be drawn to those things, that, that your Spirit's voice would be vivid in our minds, and Lord, that we'd have the courage to step out and, and to, to be your person. Lord, give us eyes to see the hurts in, in the people around us. Lord, give us uh, wisdom to know how we can meet needs and, and, and to be your hands and feet in, in whatever circumstance we find ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.